Staying with the theme of uh, the kind of UK's economy, this video is going to look at how the UK's economy has changed over time and its movement into what we refer to as a post-industrial economy. Thank you. So, we have a quick look at this graph up in the top corner. It's really, really, really rough, okay, but it's just showing time and on the bottom between 1752 projected 2050 and percentage of employment structure. And what we can see is how the different sectors of employment within the UK's economy have changed. So if we were to go back to 1750, we were looking at approximately 55% of our population. So over one in two people being employed in uh, primary industries, things such as farming and mining. And what we can see is that over time, there's been a significant decrease in that. As the UK has developed into a high income country, we generally see that our primary industries do decrease as they are outsourced to other countries. By 2050, it's projected that less than 1% of the UK's population will be employed in uh, primary industries. What we've seen at the same time as that is a change in the secondary industry, our manufacturing. Back in 1750, okay, again, quite a low number of 30%, we're saying only about one in three people employed in the secondary industry. What we saw, however, with the uh, sort of industrial revolution and uh, mechanisation of our primary industry, you know, that's reason you know as people lost their primary jobs due to the fact that uh, we got better machinery than and that could do that without the need of humans that idea of mechanization what we've seen is that people moved into the urban areas in search of work in factories okay and by kind of the peak of the industrial revolutions we got into the 1900s over 60 percent of the population of the uk was employed in secondary industries and manufacturing what we've seen though however due to globalization and the competition from uh, abroad that provides cheaper labor we've seen outsourcing of the majority of the uk's manufacturing and it's projected that by 2050, only 15% of people in the UK will be employed in secondary or manufacturing industries, okay, due to the fact that most of that uh, work would have moved abroad. What we've seen at the same time as that is a change in our tertiary employment. Now, remember, tertiary is our kind of service industry. Back in 1750, it was one of the small, it was the smallest employment sector, only 15% or so of the population employed in what we'd consider as a tertiary employment. What's then happened? is that between 1750 and 1900 there was only a very gradual change in the amount of people employed in that the majority of the growth remember was in that secondary industry as the UK's manufacturing kind of took off what we've seen though is as that manufacturing has been outsourced okay a growth in service industries okay that is quite common for high income countries to have a large amount of tertiary employment okay as much of the uh, sort of actual doing jobs the manufacturing are outsourced but things such as the provision of the services doctors nurses and the design and research of products remains in the high income country what we also saw around 1950 was the development of a fourth sector called the quaternary industry now quaternary industry basically refers to any kind of high tech uh, industry so hence why that only emerged in the 1950s but even then would have been very very small 0.1% of the population by 2050 it's expected that will have overtaken secondary industry uh, sorry primary industry and nearly be up to overtaking secondary industries as the demand for high tech products in the UK grows now this development of the tertiary and quaternary industry uh, can kind of be classed as what we call a post industrial economy and now a post industrial economy is very very common in high income countries. The majority of high income countries around the world will have what we now refer to as a post industrial economy following the process of de industrialization. From de industrialization, we we'll remember that drop in manufacturing that we saw in the UK after the 1900s, okay, where factories decided to move abroad. I mean, particularly in the UK, it would have been in things such as our coal mines shutting down, okay, and uh, therefore other industries reliant on that uh, decreasing. Now, this is going to have had a particular impact on the north of the UK, and we're going to have a look at that when we look at our north-south divide. But this process of deindustrialisation, the closing of our factories um, in the UK, uh, had a major impact on kind of the industrial heartland of the UK, which was from the Midlands up towards the north of England. Now, a post-industrial economy basically can be classed as any economy where there is a significant decrease in manufacturing, but will, at the same time a significant increase in what we would call service and knowledge industries. Now, there are five major types of um, kind of industries uh, that we would uh, refer as post-industrial. We have what we call information technology. Now, information technology businesses use computers and other hardware to store, process, and use data. This may be used to help businesses uh, advertise to the correct uh, clients, okay, or governments to kind of 
work out kind of what their uh, their population want and therefore how to get the correct kind of votes. We then also have a service industry. So these are businesses that do for work for a company or sorry for a customer and will provide goods, but not necessarily involved in the manufacturing. So for example, it may be a company uh, that you know you may employ to look for a certain product for you if you're looking for something that's quite rare. Uh, we then have finance, that's probably the largest sector of the post-industrial economy, and makes up the majority of the UK's economy nowadays. Okay? Now, the financial service industry uh, is anything to do with money, such as accountancy, money transfer, trading, and banking. Okay? We then have research and development. These industries involve uh, research and developing new ideas okay, and transforming them into workable products. We see, for example, that in a lot of manufacturing companies now, the research and development is done in the UK, and then the actual production of that good is done in a low-income country. Dyson is a perfect example of that. Okay, a UK company still has its uh, headquarters for research and development in Moundsbury in Wiltshire, but it does most of its manufacturing of those ideas in uh, Malaysia. And then we have science parks. Okay. Now, we're going to look more detailed at science parks, and we're going to focus on one that we refer to uh, that we looked at in lessons, which was Oxford Science Park. Now, a science park or business park, they're usually found on the outskirts of cities, okay, normally near main roads, okay, and uh, an area devoted to scientific research or the development of science or technology-based industries. So again, there may not be necessarily any manufacturing going on here, but it's uh, designed in to focus on the development of new technologies. Now, what we've seen in the last sort of 20 years in the UK is a massive growth in uh, the number of science parks that we find around the UK. Now, there's several reasons for this. Okay? Firstly, as I talked about earlier, with the reduction in manufacturing in the UK, but a focus on research and development, there's been more and more demand for areas where companies can set up bases to research and develop new products. Also, we're seeing an increase in an educated workforce. That UK education levels are going up, so more and more people are looking for these highly paid jobs that science parks can offer. We, at the same time, have increased financial support from our universities. As we see, the majority of our science parks around the UK are located within the vicinity of universities because these universities can then provide the support for the science park to start up and then also provide the labour, the workforce, with those high skills and education that is necessary for the high-tech industry. And then just in general, we're getting an increased demand for high-tech products. You know, it's very common now when I ask my students in pretty much any class I have who's got a, a smartphone or an Apple product, pretty much every single one of them will put their hands up. So that increased demand for high-tech products means we need an increased uh, sort of area for these kind of products to be developed. Now, what is interesting about Science Park is it links very closely into the idea about whether or not a post-industrial economy can be more environmentally sustainable. Is having a more modern industry better for the environment than a more traditional heavy manufacturing industry? Okay. Now, if we were to look at a traditional industry, what we see is an industry that is generally fossil fuel dependent. Our large factories generally run on oil or coal okay, to power them. Okay, they're normally associated with high levels of air and water pollution. And I'm thinking, for example, China, that does still have a very traditional heavy industry as part of its uh, growth. Um, you know, we're looking at air pollution levels that result in over 4,000 people being ill or dying a day in China due to air pollution-related illnesses. Heavy industry is also generally associated with high levels of noise pollution. If you've ever lived near a factory, you may be kind of aware of that. And also, because of the large space required for heavy industry, the large factories, the large storage spaces, they are also generally, unfortunately, associated with a destruction of habitats. What our science parks allow us to do as part of our post-industrial, our modern economy, okay, is still make money, okay, but provide a much more environmentally sustainable, long-lasting economy. So if we take, go back to this idea of Oxford Science Park, we can use that as our example. Okay. Oxford Science Park has had done a huge amount of work in creating wildlife habitats. So whereas traditional uh, industry results in the destruction of those, the Science Park in an attempt to create a high environmental quality which will keep their employers happy and attract the best workers okay, and also appeal to the environmentally aware workforce that they are looking to employ, have created things such as lakes and woodlands within the Science Park. This not only keeps their workers happy and their stress levels low, but 
it's an environmentally sustainable because it's creating wildlife habitats that would otherwise be destroyed by a more traditional economy. And remember, when you're talking about environmentally sustainable, it's about talking about into the future. So this means that there will be habitats in the future for wildlife to thrive. On top of that, it encourages things such as car sharing. Okay, um, So Oxford Science Park provides kind of incentives, financial incentives and bonuses for people that car share into work. So you're getting more than one or two people in a car. This obviously reduces congestion levels, therefore reducing air pollution, ensuring that uh, things such as climate change and global warming may not be as serious for future generations. Look at the way I'm talking about future generations again. Whenever you're talking about this idea of sustainability, you want to be mentioning either the future or, to make it easier for yourself, the impact for future generations. Traditional industry, as we said, is also generally reliant on fossil fuels. Science parks are trying to move away from that. Obviously, the idea, the image of a science park and its high-tech industry, it's therefore looking at modern ways of producing energy. Oxford Science Park has actually this year installed its 1,000th solar um, panel. And much of its energy production is now through renewable energy such as solar and wind energy. Again, this reduces the demand on fossil fuels. Okay, it's using a sustainable energy source that will be available into the future and will not be causing damage to the uh, atmosphere like our traditional fossil fuel dependent industries. Also, one of the things they've done to try and reduce that is they've added insulation to the buildings. And what we see is that in the last 20 years, Oxford Science Park has, resulted in, has seen a 15% reduction in its carbon emissions due to the fact that it needs to use less heating uh, and um, to keep its buildings warm due to higher insulation. 